Hi, and welcome to this live stream on um, this proposed six month course on building AI systems beyond a certain scale. I'm Andrew Ng, founder of DeepLearning.ai, and I'm delighted to have you join me here today. And uh, with me also is Yang Le Kun, who is VP and Chief AI Scientist of Meta, a professor at NYU and Turing Award winner. So Yan and I have been friends for a long time, and both he and I have thought at length about this um, six-month moratorium proposal and felt it was an important enough topic. Um, I think it would actually cause significant harm if, say, a government were to implement it. The Yan and I felt like we wanted to chat about it with you here today. Hey, Yan, glad, glad to be chatting with you about this. Hi, Andrew. It's a pleasure to be here. So just to summarize the situation, um, I think over the last decade, or maybe even over the last longer, 20, 30 years, we've seen very exciting progress in AI. Deep learning is working well. And then even in the last one or two years, feels like maybe there's even a further acceleration of progress in AI with generative AI systems, such as ChatGPT, Llama, um, uh, also image generation, mid-journey, stable diffusion, uh, DALI. Feels like maybe AI has gotten even faster. And associated with that, there are people that worry about AI, you know, fairness, bias, social, economic displacement. Um, there are also the further out speculative worries about AGI, evil sentient killer robots. But I think that there are real worries about harms, uh, possible real harms today and possibly other harms in the future uh, that, that people worry about. So in this environment, the um, Future Life Institute put out a call for a six month pause on moratorium on training AI models that are even more powerful than OpenAI's GPT-4 model. And, and a number of people, very smart people, including our friend Yosha Benjo, um, Stuart Russell, Elon Musk, uh, signed on to this, to this proposal. Um, I think Jan and I are both concerned about this proposal, but, but Jan, why don't you start? Do you, do you want to share your take on this, on this proposal? Well, I mean, my first reaction to this is that uh, uh, calling for a, 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 a delay in research and development smacks me of a new wave of obscurantism, essentially. Um, like, why slow down the progress of, uh, of knowledge and, 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 and science? Uh, then there is the question of uh, products. Like, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm all for regulating products that get in the hands of people. Uh, I don't see the point of uh, regulating uh, research and development. Uh, I don't think this serves any purpose other than reducing the knowledge that we could use to uh, actually make, uh, you know, technology better, safer also. Yeah. In fact, I feel like while AI today has some risk of harm, you know, like I think bias, fairness, concentration of power, so that kind of, those, those are real issues. Um, I think that is also creating tremendous value, right? I think, you know, with deep learning over the last 10 years and even the last year or so, last many months, the number of generative AI ideas and how to use it for education or healthcare, responsive coaching is incredibly exciting. The value that so many people are creating to help other people using AI. And I think that as amazing as GPT-4 is today, building an even better than GPT-4 will help all of these applications or help a lot of people. So pausing that progress seems like it would create a lot of harm and slow down the creation of very valuable stuff that will help a lot of people. Right. And I, you know, I think there is probably several motivations from the various signatories of that letter. Uh, some of them are perhaps on uh, one extreme are worried about, uh, you know, AGI being turned on at one point and then uh, eliminating uh, humanity on a short uh, on short notice um, I think few people really believe in this kind of scenario um, or believe it's a a, a you know definite uh, th a threat that is not uh, that cannot be uh, stopped then there are people I think who are much more reasonable who think that there is uh, real potential harms and and danger that needs to be that need to be dealt, dealt with and I agree with them uh, there is a lot of uh, Issues with uh, AI, making uh, AI systems controllable, make the, making them factual if they are supposed to provide information, um, uh, etc., uh, making them non-toxic. And I think there there is a bit of a lack of imagination in the sense of it's not like future AI systems would be designed on the same blueprint as uh, current autoregressive LLMs like ChatGPT and GPT-4, uh, or or other systems before them like like Galactica or Bard or you know whatever. 
Um, I, I think there's going to be new ideas that are going to make those systems much more controllable. And so the problem of, then it becomes a problem of uh, uh, designing objectives for those systems that are aligned with human values and, and policies. And uh, I think, you know, thinking that somehow we're smart enough to build those system to be super intelligent and not smart enough to design good objectives so that they behave properly, uh, I think is a very, very strong assumption that is, is just not, is, is very, um, it's very low probability. And then, you know, there is the question of, uh, which is more kind of a political question really, uh, is the, the question of what impact on, on, on people and, and the economy uh, will be due to the fact that, uh, you know, those products at the moment are produced by a very small number of uh, companies that are going to gain uh, 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 power and influence and are motivated by the profit uh, motive. Uh, does that have, you know, intrinsic uh, uh, risks? And, and the answer to this is proper regulation, obviously, but not stopping R&D. It's uh, regulating products. You know, about about aligning AI, I have mixed feelings about that term, but getting AI to behave well, it's actually been interesting to see the rapid progress in the last few years, acknowledging the real problems of, you know, AI generating toxic speech, those are real problems. But um, I feel like not not everyone appreciate when, when we move from base language models like GPT-3 to the instruction to models like uh, chat GPT or GPT-315 Turbo or whatever, that, that was real progress. I think the models are now much less toxic, far from perfect, and they still make fact, make stuff up. But I'm seeing real progress with instruction to models, and this is why many companies are shifting in that direction. But I think that um, stepping on the gas and delving down on, on AI safety and, and aligning AI, that feels more constructive than, than proposing a blanket pause. Um, yeah, and I, think, I agree. I, I should, I should, yeah. Uh, and actually, you, you, you're using the term uh, AI doomers. I don't think I've, that, that, that's an interesting term. Actually, I, I feel like you, Jan, for a long time, you've been speaking up against AI hype. You know, I think when deep learning was new, a lot of people had unrealistic expectations about what it could and couldn't do. And frankly, I think I was over-optimistic about self-driving cars too, so I made that mistake. But a lot of well-meaning people, you know, just overestimated right what it could and could not do and, and unfortunately contributed a little bit to hype and you and i've been speaking against hype and i think this type of um ai doom saying or ai doom is your terminology i, I think is actually another type of hype that ai could escape and overpower us all and that type of ai doom saying hype is is, is i think also harmful because it also creates unrealistic expectations I agree. And I think also the, the fact that now, you know, things like ChatGPT and GPT-4 have been in the hands of, uh, of, of people and then the, you know, the Microsoft version of them, um, that, that people have been playing with it, it gives the impression perhaps that we are closer to human level intelligence uh, because we as humans are very, uh, we're sort of very linguist, you know, language oriented. We think that when something is fluent, it's also intelligent, but it's not true. And those systems have a very superficial understanding of the of reality. Uh, they don't have any experience of reality, really. Uh, they're, they're trained purely from text. I mean, GPT-4 is trained a little bit with images as well, but uh, but mostly their understanding of the world is extremely superficial. And this is uh, one reason why they can uh, essentially produce uh, nonsense that sounds convincing, uh, but isn't. And uh, we're not that close to human level intelligence. There is no question in my mind, and this is not hype, there is no question in my mind that uh, sometimes in the next few decades, we'll have systems whose intelligence level equals or surpasses uh, human intelligence in all the domains where humans are, uh, are intelligent. But uh, human intelligent, intelligence is very specialized. Uh, we think we have general intelligence, but we don't. We are incredibly specialized. And, and those systems are going to be much better than us in all kinds of domains. Uh, there's, no, there's no question this will happen. It's not going to happen tomorrow. Uh, and until we have some sort of blueprint of a system that has at least a chance of reaching human intelligence, discussions on how to uh, properly make them safe and, and all that stuff is, I think, premature. Because how can you, I don't know, design uh, uh, you know, seat belts for a car if uh, the, the car doesn't exist? How can you design, you know, safe jet engines if you haven't invented the airplane yet? So uh, so I think, you know, some of those questions are, are premature. And I think uh, a bit of the 
the sort of panic um, uh, towards that that future is uh, is is misguided. Yeah. So you know maybe we're on a we've made one year of wildly exciting progress in AI in the last one year, and hopefully we'll keep on making wildly exciting progress for the next thirty or fifty years, and then maybe we'll have some sort of AGI then. Um, but until we're closer, it's really difficult to know how the how, and and. As we're on that, you know, fifty-year journey, say to get to AGI or whatever, a half month pause before the next forty-nine and a half years of work. I, I'm not really seeing the why that's quickly helpful. Yeah, I mean, I mean, clearly we're not anywhere close to human level intelligence. Otherwise, we would have level five autonomous driving, as you were mentioning, and we don't, right? Uh, how is it that a teenager can learn to to drive in about twenty hours of training? Uh, and you know, we don't have self-driving cars, and we have systems that are fluent in language. But the amount of data they've been trained on, which is on the order of a trillion words, uh, it would take on the order of 22,000 years for a human reading eight hours a day to go through this. I mean, that's just insane, right? So uh, so clearly, the kind of intelligence that is formed by this is not the type that we observe in humans. If we if we did, I mean, it's a, another example of the Mar Moravec uh, paradox, things that you know appear sophisticated uh, to us in terms of intelligence, like playing chess and writing text turn out to be relatively simple for, for machines, whereas things we take for granted, which, you know, that any 10-year-old can do, I don't know, clearing out the table, the dinner table, and, you know, filling up the dishwasher. We don't have robots that can do this yet. You worked on this, Andrew, I remember, on filling up dishwashers, yes. but it's not... It's uh, not oh, it's totally optimistic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, 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 then, and, and then, let's see. So yeah, the thing. So I think you would agree, right? We're very far from um, uh, from AGI. Oh, so and I think all of you watching this, um, the YouTube live stream also has a link for Slido comments. I think Jan and I, we both have access to the, everyone's questions. We'll jump to that in about what you know, ten minutes or something, and and take people's questions. So if you could pop your questions in the Slido link on the YouTube live stream. Um, and you know, so so in addition to the you know problems with the premises, right, of this AI AGI AI escape. Um, I think one of the challenges as well, the proposal is, is it, it, it doesn't seem implementable. You know, I feel like some things are implementable. So for example, um, you know, uh, I think that having proposing that we do more to research AI safety, you know, maybe more transparency auditing, let's have more public right, NSF or other public funding for basic research on AI, those would be constructive proposals. But the idea of um, asking AI labs to slow down, especially in this, you know, frankly, competitive business environment with labs and countries trying to build advanced technologies is actually creating a lot of value. It just doesn't seem practical, implementable to me. And the only thing worse than that would be if government steps in to pass legislation to pause AI, which would be really terrible innovation policy. I can't imagine it being a good idea for government to pass laws to slow down progress of technology that even the governments and frankly even ex you know, that that don't don't fully understand, right? And we were talking about GPT uh, four or ChatGPT or whatever OpenAI uh, puts out at the moment. We're not talking about research and development. We're talking about product development. Okay, so uh, OpenAI kind of pivoted from uh, an AI research lab that was relatively open, uh, as the name indicates, into uh, a for-profit company and now a kind of a contract research lab for mostly for Microsoft uh, that is the product development and doesn't reveal anything about the product anymore, about how they work. So this is product development. It's not uh, AI R&D. And, uh, you know, when, you know, stopping the, 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 the product development, I think, is, uh, is, a, is a question. You want to perhaps regulate products that are put um, that are made available to the public, you know, if uh, if they endanger public safety, uh, obviously that's that's where government should uh, intervene. That's what it does for you know drugs and airplanes and cars and just about everything that consumers can can put out. So some level of uh, regulation here, if it's done right, is uh, not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, but you don't you don't regulate a technology. You don't regulate um, uh, R and D in a technology. That's um, you know, that's, that's uh, you know, I've, I've, I'm, I'm going to give you um, an example. Also, you have to be very careful if you regulate technology that people want and, 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 and helps. Um, so I've, I've um, uh, used this example on, on some of my uh, posts on social networks that uh, there was knee-jerk reactions of uh, similar types. Uh, for example, when the printing press uh, started popping up, the Catholic Church was extremely resistant to it. 
um, because it would, um, they said it would destroy society, and it did, um, because it, it basically enabled people to read the Bible, and it created the Protestant movement, and uh, you know, also had bad side effects like religious wars in Europe for a couple hundred years. But it also enabled the dissemination of the Enlightenment and uh, you know, science and rationalism and democracy, and uh, which resulted in the creation of the United States, by the way. Uh, so, so this this had overall. Um, a good effect. So what, what we need to do when a new technology is uh, uh, put in place like this is make sure the, the, the benefits, the, the positive effects are maximized and the negative ones are, are minimized. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily go through stopping it. Uh, the Ottoman Empire, when uh, the printing press appeared, stopped it because they were concerned that, uh, again, this would kind of get people to think outside of the religious orthodoxy or uh, their political power. And, uh, the, you know, that part of the world basically kind of became an intellectual backwater, even though at the time they were pretty dominant in mathematics and science um, um, by stopping a system that amplifies people's intelligence, which is what we're talking about here. Uh, you're taking a step back in terms of progress of humanity. I mean, AI is going to be an amplification of human intelligence we might we might see a, a new renaissance because of it okay a new enlightenment if you want uh, and yeah. uh, why would you why would we want to stop that yeah and and just to just to add to the the idea of regulating technology I, I i agree with you almost entirely and there is just one exception so a lot of the um uh, some of the authors of the petition, I think in the FAQ, referred to the uh, Asilomar 1975 meeting on recombinant DNA. And I feel like that analogy is, is, is not a great analogy, in my opinion, because when um, you know, researchers are doing research on DNA, uh, recombinant DNA back in the 60s and 70s, their research on monkey viruses, for example, and there was a real risk of you know, creating a new disease that would escape and infect people and harm. And as we've just seen with COVID, you know, pandemics are a real thing and they're really, really terrible for society. And um, so I think back in 1975, the Asiloma Conference had put in place uh, um, kind of containment mechanisms for if they're doing, you know, certain types of DNA research. And I think that was a good idea. And the reason I have, I find it troubling to make an analogy between that Asiloma conference and what happens in AI, which seems to be one of the popular themes out there, is AI escape is just not, I don't see any realistic risk of AI escape. Um, unlike, you know, escape of infectious diseases, that is a risk. But AI escape would imply not only do we get to AGI, which will take, you know, decades probably, but that AGI is so wily and so smart, it outsmarts all of these billions of people that don't want AI to harm us or kill us. And that that's just an impossible scenario for, for I don't know, decades or maybe centuries or maybe even longer. Yeah, I mean, I think there are interesting debate, intellectual debates to have about uh, around this question. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, um, some of the ones that you see online are unreasonable, but some of them are reasonable. So there, there is actually, there's been a, a discussion following an article that uh, I, I co-wrote with Tony Zader that was published in Scientific American uh, four years ago, whose title was Don't Fear the Terminator. And basically what we said, you know, those scenarios where uh, AI systems will want to dominate humanity are unrealistic because you need to have a motivation to dominate to actually dominate. Uh, and that motivation exists in humans because we are a social species. It exists in a number of other social species. It does not exist in non-social species um, because they don't have the need for it. And there is no reason it will uh, exist in AI systems that we design. We can design their objectives so that they are non-dominant, submissive. Uh, or, or you know, they obey certain uh, certain rules that are in line with uh, the best interest of humanity as a whole. As a whole. So, um, so as as you said, this this scenario is uh, is, is is completely implausible. Yeah, and yeah, th there's actually one thing that occurs to me, which is I think um, societal sentiment toward tech. I feel like 10, 20 years ago, tech was all good, it's wonderful, creating value for everyone. And then I think, you know, over the last five, six, seven years, society realized that there were real problems with tech. And then I feel like, and this is controversial, I feel like the media sentiment swung appropriately, but swung too far in the tech is bad and all these harms. And I feel like a, a more balanced view, let's acknowledge the wonderful things tech is doing and creating for everyone, even while acknowledging the very real 
you know, risk of harm. We do have problems with safety, interpretation, transparency, concentration of power, privacy. Those are real things that we're all mostly been working on. And then I think this um, media swing a little bit too far to what negative sentiment on tech, I think feeds into this 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 kind of hype and, and sentiment that I don't think is also, I think actually a more balanced view would, would be more helpful for moving things forward. I mean, there's clearly some of that, I think, uh, the, this kind of perception. Uh, certainly, you know, working at Meta and being being a bit of a uh, public figure, I've been a bit of the center of that controversy somehow, uh, even though, you know, I don't, you know, I'm not involved in Meta's content policy or anything like that or, or privacy policy or anything. But uh, what I think people don't realize is that it's not just, there is a problem with tech that the public and the press has uh, uh, identified, but the tech industry itself has identified those problems too, and and has attempted to uh, to correct them and mitigate them. So you know the side effects of uh, ranking algorithms in social networks, for example, uh, some of it was predictable and sort of fixed before it happened, and some of it wasn't, and it was fixed when it when it occurred. In the meantime, you know there was perhaps uh, bad uh, bad side effects, and some of them are limited by technology. So one thing that people don't realize is that. AI, uh, progress in AI is part of the solution to some of the problems that social networks have encountered. And I'm not just talking about, about uh, Facebook or, or Instagram. That includes you know, YouTube and, and you know, TikTok and Twitter and everything. So uh, uh, the, the progress in AI has allowed things like you know, taking down hate speech more efficiently and, and things like that. And this is due entirely to large language models. You know, uh, because we have large language models, uh, not of the same type, not the autoregressive type that we see in ChatGPT uh, and others, but uh, the sort of BERT style, uh, we can do things like uh, do a pretty good job, a better job than that we could, we ever could, in you know detecting hate speech in most languages in the world. That was impossible before. Yeah. That only occurred in the last four or five years. That's due to progress in AI. AI is part of the solution. There, it's not it's not the problem. It's part of the solution. Yeah, that's a good point. And I feel like the way that um, th there are irresponsible ways to roll products, like rolling a yeah. self-driving car that kills people, that would be irresponsible. Uh, well, you know, there are irresponsible ways to do that anyway. Uh, but then I think a lot of technology, it just isn't perfect the first time out. And the practical way to roll it out is to roll it out in a self-contained way, limit harm, limit dangers, and inc incrementally roll it out so you can better monitor you know, and mitigations for the harmful cases can then develop the, the solutions to it. So, so the pausing progress seems like doesn't seem helpful. We should release things in a very controlled way and make sure it's not harmful. And and I think some of the risks of harm are are overblown. I guess yeah. Well, we'll, we'll talk about. It. Hey, just keep on the clock. Should should we go and take a look at the? Let, let's take some of the questions on Slido. Um, so thanks everyone for uh, posting questions on slide and voting up. There are over 500 questions. Sorry, Yana, I won't really take 500 questions in seven minutes, but the top voted one, uh, what are the conditions slash scenario slash tipping point that if it happens, you know, the AI post would be a good idea, posted by an anonymous poster? I, mean, I think if, yeah, sure. So, I mean, if, if there is, uh, you know, something that is uh, deployed perhaps on a small scale for trials, and there is uh, identification of, of real harm because there are two kinds of harm. There is potential harm and real harm. Uh, there is imagined harm, um, and and you know if you, if there is uh, real harm, you you should you know stop that product from from being deployed. Uh, now you know should it mean that you should ban all a, all of AI research? No. Um, uh, so it's very difficult to identify before it occurs, but um, but when it occurs. On a small scale, you take corrective measures, and that's what's happened in the you know history of technology, right? I mean, the first cars were were very unsafe; they didn't have good brakes, they didn't have safety belts, there were no uh, traffic signals, blah blah blah, and those things were put in place progressively to make it safer. Same for aviation, and eventually you have a regulatory agency that makes sure uh, those those products are safe. So you, you know that's the way it's gonna it's gonna work. There is no intrinsic qualitative difference between AI and previous technological advances. Yeah, and, and, and add to that, in the case of um, genetic pathogen research, there was a plausible path to harm, you know, pathogens escaping, recombinant DNA as low conference. That was very difficult to pull back. Even the most powerful governments in the world can't shut off 
you know, a pathogen once it's released. And I think the fact that today governments can, you know, pass legislation to cause companies to shut down their service, we do have the option to shut things down relatively quickly if it causes harm. So that that kind of is another strong defense. Right? Exactly. Um, hey, actually, uh, second question, Jan, uh, oh, th this one mentions you. Um, how should we interpret leading explicit disagreement reports, e.g. Yosha Benjo being a signatory while, while Jan uh, opposes it? Okay, Yoshua is, a, is an old friend, uh, a very good friend, and we've known each other since he was a master's student and I was a postdoc. Um, so that goes, that goes back a very long time to the 1980s. And, uh, you know, people have different opinions and different motivations. And he, he certainly has different, um, slightly different political opinions than mine. And I think he's motivated by those for signing this. He sees the, the danger of... Uh, uh, you know, companies controlling a technology for profit motive as intrinsically bad. Um, I I don't believe so. Uh, I think it should be controlled, but I, I don't think it's intrinsically bad necessarily. Uh, he is very much uh, against the idea that uh, R&D and AI should, uh, should be secret, done in secret. And I agree with him. I'm a very, very strong proponent of open research. Uh, but again, we're not talking about research here. We're talking about products. Um, I've been a, a huge proponent of open research, and I think it should um, it should it should continue that way. Uh, you know, partly I think people are unhappy about OpenAI being secretive now, because most of the ideas that have been used by them in their products were actually not from them. They were ideas that were published, you know, by people at Google and Fair and and various other uh, you know academic groups, etc. And and now they are kind of you know being kind of under, under lock and key, but this is not going to last very long uh, in the sense that there's going to be a lot of other products that have very similar uh, uh, capabilities, if not better, uh, you know, within relatively short order. Yeah, OpenAI has a bit of a advance because of the flywheel of data of having many users for the system that allows them to fine tune it, uh, but it's not going to last. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, this is a leading to Nick's question as well. Um, are you concerned that in the near future, most advanced AI models we own solely by a few companies can afford the compute costs? Um, I think I mean, I'll, I'll take no. a stab at this one. I, I am I am concerned a little bit, but not very concerned because the infrastructure layer of LLMs looks hyper competitive right now. I think OpenAI did a great job with you know scaling up LLMs, transformers, and really pushing forward the instruction two models. Really, at least two major breakthroughs I, I would attribute to OpenAI. But you know, Meta's release of Llama was a great thing. Uh, I think that uh, Google's you know, Palm model, uh, and it's becoming hyper competitive with many large and small organizations releasing different LLMs. So right now it looks very competitive. And in the market space, I see a lot of excitement then building the application layer on top of the large LLMs. Absolutely. I think this is gonna get democratized actually fairly, fairly quickly. So yes, if you want to train the biggest LLM ever, uh, you're going to need a lot of computing resources, uh, but uh, most usage, I mean, there's going to be some sort of, uh, you know, pyramid of uh, all kinds of models where um, the, the simplest models, which are still useful, are going to be, you know, more widely available. You, you're going to be able to run them on relatively modest uh, hardware, possibly on mobile devices on short order. Uh, and, uh, and, and you're going to have a lot of uh, such uh, LLMs, uh, or, or systems of that type available with different degrees of openness uh, for uh, you know either research groups or, or products uh, on short order. It, it's, it's competitive, which means there is a lot of uh, motivation for people to put things out there. And some of them are going to be more open than others. Yeah. Hey, let's take one last question. We'll do it real quick and I'll try to end on time. So last, last question. Um, how do you think about the role of AI in engineering? What should the student do to prepare for the future and make good engineering applications in the future? Uh, yeah, you take a okay, go ahead. Uh, uh, sure. So I think I think AI is wildly exciting. AI is a general purpose technology, both deep learning, supervised learning, and generative AI. These are general purpose technologies, meaning they aren't good just for one thing. They're good for a lot of different things. And so these technological advancements give us opportunities to go around, check non tech all corners of the economy to find valuable applications, be it education or healthcare or coaching or lots of things, right? Improving industrial automation, whatever, to find important applications and go and build them in a responsible, ethical, fair way to create value for everyone. So it's a fantastic time to learn about these technologies and go find use cases and build and not to pause this exciting building. Right, so that's on the side of engineering and product development and on the side of research, 
uh, nobody should get the idea that, that AI is solved. Um, as I said, we still, we still don't have uh, you know, domestic robots that can clear the table and fill up the dishwasher. We're missing something big in terms of the learning capabilities of humans and animals that we still cannot reproduce in machines. Uh, we can't have systems that can reason and plan. Uh, the, the current uh, LLMs cannot really plan at all. Um, they can produce plants that already exist uh, that they stored in their memory, but they can't really plan. So there's a big, big challenge for the next few years in AI research uh, for machines that you know can uh, achieve human intelligence. And it's not going to be obtained by simply scanning up uh, autoregressive LLMs and, and you know training them with tokenized multimodal data. It's going to take a lot more than that. Yeah, yeah. well said. Lots of exciting research to be done still. Lots of exciting product work to be done still. Um, I think it's a good time. It's actually exhilarating and frankly, sometimes exhausting to be uh, working AI. I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, um, I think we're, we're at time. Thanks, thanks a lot, Jan. I'm really glad we could jump on this call and, and chat. I'm really glad that you know, you, you all, you're watching this, that, that all of you could join us today too. So. Um, I hope this was helpful. Let's keep the conversation going. I think we should keep on pushing forward AI to create value for everyone. So let's keep the conversation going. And thanks. Thank you, Yang. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks. Thanks, Yang. Thanks, everyone.